there is a concept, uh, if you go to university, it would be uh, in the philosophy department. Uh, the concept is called worldview. I think I've talked about it before. Essentially what worldview means is it's the lens by which we see everything around us. And if you study worldview, you'll see all the different components that make up a person's worldview. But you're not going to be too shocked and you don't have to go to college again to understand this concept, right? When you think about a worldview, they would say that there are different things that would shape your worldview, right? If we look at it, uh, something that shapes it might be your family or your upbringing, right? Imagine if you uh, came here and you were an immigrant family, first generation in America, right? Your upbringing and what you did and how you became a part of America is going to shape how you view your country. Um, if you grew up in the Depression era, right? I remember uh, moving people that used to grow up in the Depression era, and when you go unload their moving trucks, you literally find everything they've had their entire life because they throw nothing away. Because you just never did that as a child. Because you had to keep everything, right? It was, it was hard to come by. So it shapes how you view your world as life went on. Another thing that shapes our worldview, no doubt, is education. Um, we obviously teach math and science and social studies and all those subjects in our grade school and high schools and colleges. But what the teachers believe behind it, what's being taught along with it, right? It does shape and form the minds of young people as they view how math and science and social studies and English, how that portrays in their world. And so education is a big deal and it shapes how you view things. Another thing, and this is more modern thought with worldview, is social media, right? And you understand what that is. Everything that you consume, right? Many of us are consuming most of our news through devices, through our phones, even the stations we get on our TV, and here's what we start to realize. The algorithms, right, how everything is made is meant to give you a message that appeals to you. And it starts, and it appeals to you, it starts to put you more and more of the same thought, of the same concept. It becomes this echo chamber in your life, so you think that everybody must think in this one certain way. Right? It has a dramatic, almost shocking effect now on how people view everything in this world. Personal experience will shape how you view life. If you have joy or sorrow, experience tragedy, great hardship, right? Sometimes that becomes the lens by which you interpret things. And the final part that everyone will agree is God's word or your spiritual formation is also going to shape how you view things. But you look at worldview, especially how people speak about it today, is what's the subtle thing that is wrong with what's on the screen? What people will not agree on is the place that God's word, that your faith should play in shaping you. And what culture will tell you today is that God's word is supposed to be like this. It's not supposed to be just one of them. It's just part of your worldview. It's partly going to shape how you view things. But all the other things should play a role too. But that's not what God's word says. Right? If we say that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path, that's what the psalmist says, Psalm 119, then God's word is going to shape everything. So as we look at all of these different things in life, we're going to look at it through the lens of the Bible to see what does God first say, and then with well, these other things, do they agree with it? God's Word helps me interpret how I'm supposed to view everything in the world. And I think it's especially important as we start looking at the commandments that move from dealing with God to people and now the material. Right? Commandments 1 through 3, our relationship with God. Commandments 4, 5, and 6, our relationship with others around us. And now commandment 7, you shall not steal, is our relationship when it comes to the stuff around us, the material around us. Really, everything that we see that's not people. 
And the seventh commandment is very simple and straightforward. You shall not steal. And how did Martin Luther explain it? He said this, we should fear and love God that we do not take our neighbor's money or property or get it by dishonest dealing, but help him to improve and protect his property and business. Right, in the seventh commandment, very straightforward, do not take what's not yours. And as all the commandments also show us is, not only is we think about you doing this, but then your actions are supposed to not just be, to not prevent you from taking someone else's property, but you're supposed to help them with their property, to help improve that property and their business. But there is, the Bible does undergird this commandment with more concepts that, that help shape it into a bigger way. Um, Luther's explanations are, are a great thing to, to give a simple explanation to the commandment, but sometimes it, just, it does limit us because we never go past his explanation. But today we're going to go past this explanation a little bit more and see why does God really want us not to steal? What's the point of it all? If you heard what the psalmist said in those first two verses, right? Who owns everything? The answer simply is God, right? And, and why would the Bible say that God is the owner of everything? It's because God created everything, God shaped everything, God formed everything. In the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, the Bible records that God made everything simply by his word. Let there be and there was. And then as the Bible describes what God did with the crown of his creation, he went from just using his word to using his hands to forming us from the dust of the ground. So because God is the creator, God is the author, God is the sustainer of everything, the Bible says that everything belongs to him. Let's apply it to the parking lot. Whose cars are out there? Apply it to your house. Whose house it is? Apply it to the bank account. Whose bank account is there? Right? If you looked at this passage, you would say, well, that's not my car. That's God's car. It's not my house. That's God's house. It's not my bank account. It's God's bank account. But at the same time, your name is on the title of your car and your name is on your mortgage. Maybe the bank's name's on both those two. Maybe your co-owners, right? Your name is on your bank account. God owns it, but do you own it too? Right? With the children, we essentially say yes, because that, that concept is a lot clearer that way. But there's a different word, I think, for us to use now to expand that concept just a little bit more. And if we say God is the owner of everything, then what's my relationship to things that, quote unquote, the world will say I own? The biblical term we'd say is that stewardship, right? We're managing God's gifts to us. Um, very often when you see the word stewardship, you, you see it with a plant because it, it's a picture we're, we're supposed to get from that. Uh, for instance, if I uh, go in my neighborhood, there's a couple huge homes, beautiful lawns and gardens. And when I walk by there, there are times I see people working in those gardens, and I'm pretty sure that the people working in those gardens, they don't live in the house. They're hired by the owner of the house. And they planted the gardens, they're mowing the lawn, they're making them all look beautiful, they're pulling all the weeds. And if I walk by and ask that person, do you own these gardens? Now, he planted them, he mows the lawn, he trims them. He pulls the weeds. He sprays them for bugs. He does everything necessary to make sure they stay beautiful and green, but he would never say he owns them. He would say, no, I just work here. The person in this house owns the gardens. Right? That's the biblical concept of stewardship. That we have all of these things, but we're not owners of them all. We're managers of them all. Right? There's no reasons why today we looked at the Luther's explanation to the first article. Right? And you start thinking about what we said there. God made me. He gave me my body and soul, eyes, ears, all my members, my mind, all my abilities. God richly and daily provides clothing and food, shoot and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, cattle. Right? You remember that explanation. And you start to see that that is showing the concept of stewardship that says God has given them all to me as blessings. 
And now God says, uh, you are the manager of what I have given you. How does this apply today? What does culture say about it? Because I think that's one of the issues when it comes to the commandments. We are so inundated with messages from culture, right? And that whole idea of worldview is shaped not just with God's word for a lot of people. It's shaped by what we see and, and what people tell us. So, for instance, um, terms used today, uh, environmentalist, uh, green energy, right? You use those terms, it, people often get a little bit spirited about it. And they might say, well, I don't even believe in that. Why? Well, I understand what they mean by that, right? Nothing should be such a priority and such a God in your life that it dictates everything that you do. At the same time, we are managers of not just the stuff we have, but God's creation. So I appreciate clean air, right? You appreciate if you go to a country that doesn't have clean air and you start coughing all the time. I appreciate turning on my water faucet and having clean water. And as a manager of the creation that God has so blessed us with, we'll do everything that we can to continue to make sure that we're managing in a way that gives glory to God and honors what he has created here. Another example of of culture when it comes to being stewards. What about how culture views your property and your wealth and your money, right? You think about social media. We are inundated with pictures of the accumulation of massive amounts of wealth. We are inundated with pictures that that show just um, amazing, expensive, million, multi-million dollar cars and lives of stars and of famous people that are just doing beautiful and amazing things. And we realize, for me to do that, I need to acquire more and more. And so you start to see that, that suddenly what culture tells me, all these amazing things out there, the money, the wealth, the homes, the vacations, that suddenly it changes my view of just being just a blessing that I have because of the blessings that I have. It becomes something that consumes me and I reach out for and search after. And I work at acquiring that for the sake of acquiring that. To do that for the sake of living that lifestyle. Instead of viewing all of those things as blessings and then my role in that as a blessing. You see, if you let culture tell you how to view the material, suddenly two different concepts start to come into your mind. You say either, what's mine is mine and I'm going to keep it. Right, it starts to develop this selfish attitude. Or what you start seeing more today too is, what's yours is mine, and I'm going to try to take it. And you see both of those attitudes in the gospel lesson too. This is not just a modern day issue. When you look at the life of Zacchaeus, you start seeing a man who said, what's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. The accumulation of wealth for a tax collector was a big deal. You also saw Zacchaeus with that too, that what's yours is also going to be mine and I'm going to steal it. Right? We look at the narrative from Luke. This idea of a tax collector in Jesus' day meant that he was a hated and despised person. Not just for being a thief because what tax collectors did was they not only collected taxes for the Roman government, but they made sure that they collected more than enough so they could pad their pocketbooks too. So it was just common knowledge in those days that the tax collectors were stealing from you. And because Zacchaeus was a Jewish man, he was stealing from his own people and he was stealing on behalf of the occupying nation of Rome. So he had the occupying force as his muscle who didn't care what he did or how much he took as long as they got theirs. And so people just despised, they were often talked about in the Bible, right? You had tax collectors and prostitutes in the same sentence. That was the friend group. But then you start to see how Jesus impacted Zacchaeus' worldview. I don't know how Zacchaeus originally knew about Jesus, but he must have knew something about him. Maybe John the Baptist was preaching when Zacchaeus was a little bit younger and he heard him. Maybe as the tax collector in his booth there in Jericho when Jesus' disciples would walk by, he'd hear some teaching at various times. 
or he talked to some of his friends and who have, who have been a, a part of Jesus' life. Whatever reason, Zacchaeus saw Jesus, he wanted to see Jesus, and even in Jesus' day, this was kind of strange for a grown man to climb up into a tree to go see over a crowd to see Jesus coming by. And you start to see the all-knowing Jesus who sees Zacchaeus in the tree, tells him to get down, says, I'm going to your house today. Right? Zacchaeus is pretty excited. The person he came to see wants to be with him. I like how Luke records the phrase, the people muttered. You start to see what's in their heart with that word muttering. It means they're angry. It has a sense of a little bit of judgment too. Because they knew who Zacchaeus was, they knew what was in his heart because they saw his actions. At least that's what Zacchaeus portrayed. And they call him, look at that word, a sinner. And that's the right word. Zacchaeus was a Jewish man, which means he knew the law of God. He knew what the general idea was you don't take things that are not yours. He knew the commandment that said, do not steal, and yet he did. He stole and stole so often and so much that his whole life was about it. And he wasn't just hurting his fellow man. He just wasn't being a, uh, uh, an arm of a government that was oppressive. Zacchaeus was a sinner. And I think you have to use that word because you don't use the word sinner when it comes to breaking the seventh commandment. You start to realize something else about the commandment. See, I think without using the word sin, it becomes very easy to justify behavior. Right? We use the word sin, it means I'm not just hurting you, I'm offending God. When I use the word sin, I'm not just saying that this is a bad deal for all of us. No, I'm saying that this is very much of a bad deal for me because now I've offended the God who says, be holy because I'm holy. If you don't use the word sin when it comes to breaking the seventh commandment, you can justify the idea that what's mine is mine and I'm going to keep it. I've worked hard for these things. I am, and so this is my ownership And essentially say, well, I'm just kind of selfish. You see how easy it is to justify your behavior, especially in culture, if you don't connect it the way God connects it. That if you don't view yourself as a steward instead of an owner and you get to decide what's best for you and it doesn't matter what anyone else says, including God, then suddenly you went away from just being this negative or hurting other people. You forget that I am hurting my God. But what was wrong with this isn't the word sin, it was the muttering when they saw Jesus confront Zacchaeus. Because that's who Jesus came for. Right? He came to save sinners. And so you start to see something amazing that when Jesus comes to the house of Zacchaeus, look at verse 9. He says, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Right? That phrase, Zacchaeus, son of Abraham, essentially means that Zacchaeus believes who Jesus was as the Messiah. That Zacchaeus believes that Jesus is his Savior. And even though in succession it comes after Zacchaeus says these words, right? Look what Zacchaeus says. I give half of my possessions to the poor. If I've cheated anybody up anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Jesus doesn't say, well, good. Now that you're doing that, you are a believer. No, those actions of Zacchaeus show that he believed and trusted that Jesus was his Savior from sin. Right, it's very specific, isn't it, Zacchaeus' actions? Uh, If you look back in the book of Exodus, there actually was prescribed restitution to people who stole from someone. Not only gave what you took back, but then there was a a times amount to make sure that they got back more than what you took from them. And even Zacchaeus, you compare the book of Exodus to what Zacchaeus did, Zacchaeus gave much more generously even than God's word required him to do. But here's what you see, that when Zacchaeus understood who Jesus was, when he understood the impact of Jesus in his life, it allowed Zacchaeus to to 
get through all of what culture was telling him, all the justification of his own behavior, and see, not only was I a sinner, and that's true, but I also have a Savior that takes care of everything. You look at what Jesus did and how he not only spoke to Zacchaeus, but he came into Zacchaeus' house and he changed his life. And it impacted Zacchaeus in an eternal way, but also in an earthly way. As suddenly Zacchaeus' mind and how he viewed the things he got from God was different. Right? That's a Christian worldview. That's a biblical worldview. Imagine how you would view things differently when Jesus comes into your home, into your life, and you start to see yourself not as the owner of everything, but as a manager of everything. Right? How often are we consumed by worry over the bills? How often are we consumed by worry over do I have enough things in my bank account, enough money there, so someday I can retire? How often can we so easily be consumed with the acquiring more and doing more? And we're not even sure why sometimes. I guess that's why I want to. And, and maybe the why often is because that's what I see, at least that's what I think I see others doing and how we're so scared sometimes to give things away because I'm not really sure if I have enough for myself. But then God's word changes our worldview. The tightly held grip we have on our possessions starts to loosen up a little bit as we realize that we're just managers of them. And so as we go to our jobs, and sure, we are working to someday retire, but we are a manager. And so I am working, so I receive blessings through my work. That's how God's going to bless me. But then when I finally have the ability to retire, then now I can see, oh, oh, life is over. It's good. I can just kick back and relax and just consume everything that I've worked so hard for. Sure, but I'm also still a manager. So now, in retirement then, someday I can now be a blessing to others when I'm not trying to just work every hour for just keeping my bills paid. That when we're allowed to go on vacation as a family and, and go to our cottages and, and, and go down south and do all these neat things to, to relax and to enjoy each other's company, what a wonderful thing. But at the same time, we make sure our children know that yeah, these are blessings from God. After church last night, uh, someone came up to me and said, uh, Pastor, I, I sometimes don't like calling all of these things blessings. My car, my house, money, all the things I do. He goes, I don't want to sound like a Bible thumper. I, I think we get what he means, and I understand that too. But at the same time, the worldview, the Christian worldview, the biblical worldview, that's what it says. God's not against large homes. God's not against high-powered jobs. It's not a sin to take vacations or own campers and places up north or any of those things. But the worldview that God wants me to have is to say that all of those blessings that I have are his. I am a manager of those blessings that God has so entrusted me with. And to much is given, God says, much is expected. And when I view that that way, and my children see me viewing those things as blessings, not strictly owners, suddenly my worldview changes. I see Jesus shaping not just my faith life here, I see Jesus shaping my home life. I see Jesus shaping my work life as I view myself at my job as true a manager because the gift I have is my ability to work. 
and then I'm not a Bible thumper. No, I'm a person that knows and believes and trusts in Jesus. And just like Zacchaeus, Jesus says to me then every day, salvation has come to your home. Because we live and we act as stewards of everything God has given us. Amen.